do have. And so appreciate each of you guys being a part of this. And uh, we are continuing to allow this to, uh, to snowball and continue to get a larger audience for our University of Minnesota Extension uh, Sheep and Goat meetings. Uh, we do have a great team that, uh, that helps to put this together. Uh, you will see some of those and they will also helping be responding to some of those questions. If you have some discussion that you wish to add to some of our information uh, and dialogue in that chat box, uh, feel free to add it because as we know here with our presenters as well is that there's lots of ways that, uh, that and maybe some tips and tricks that you may be aware of, uh, but uh, we've got a, a great team. And, you know, as we talked about it earlier that, uh, you know, that it uh, takes a, a, a village to raise a child. Well, we also have a village here to, uh, to, to raise some kids. And we say that in the goat sense as well. So hopefully uh, uh, you uh, have some questions. Uh, we will put those questions in the chat box. I will let you know just a little bit is that we will be recording uh, Kyle Roseboom and he will be our first presenter. We'll take some questions uh, after his presentation uh, and then Dr. Whitney Knauer will present on her topic as well. And so we'll take some questions after hers that were more specific and then have a group portion of, of anything that may still be um, needed to follow up on. So with that, uh, again, I appreciate you joining us, um, and we want to uh, pass this on to, uh, to Mr. Kyle Roseboom. He works in our animal sciences department at the University of Minnesota, and uh, certainly has some background in lots of different livestock species, but actually oversees the sheep uh, operation that we have on campus and does a great job, and we've asked him to provide some information primarily to birthing and also to Stosha. Kyle? Charge on, the floor is yours. Thanks, Travis. Um, thanks everybody for uh, for the big participation. I, this is probably the biggest group that I've talked to uh, in the three uh, webinar series events I did for Extension. So this is awesome. Um, like Travis said, uh, my name is Kyle Roseboom. I'm housed here on the St. Paul campus here at the University of Minnesota. And uh, a part of my job responsibilities is that I uh, am faculty supervisor for the uh, sheep program here on campus. We run about 40 mature ewes, so we're a smaller flock. Our primary emphasis is the production of sheep that we can use for our teaching activities. Um, and we also sell some lambs. So we're more geared towards the, uh, you'd probably say the weather style or the shoring style Hampshires. Um, and, and, and so we keep those ewes on campus. And part of my responsibility then is uh, I teach the senior level sheep and goat management class and, and that class uh, uh, is responsible for the management of the sheep flock. We have a totally student ran sheep flock. We don't have any uh, adult managers, so to speak. So the students, uh, we have a head shepherd and an assistant shepherd. They're both undergrad students here. And then the, uh, the sheep management class that I'm teaching this spring semester actually is responsible for much of the management of the sheep. And so we're, we're kind of right in this topic right now, so to speak. I'm, this lecture, uh, this seminar you're gonna to see tonight is actually a lecture that I started on Wednesday with the students and I'll uh, finish tomorrow at 12 o'clock with the students because we're right in the same issue as many of you are. Uh, we begin lambing next week. Um, and our students actually uh, do all the lambing. And so I have 15 students in there right now and uh, not a one of them comes from a sheep background. And those students actually, after a little bit of training, working with them, uh, teaching them through these web or through these lectures, uh, we turn them loose and they all have to do a lambing watch and they all have to sign up for times to take care of the ewes. And so, um, you know, hopefully it'll get instills confidence in those of you tonight that are beginners or, or and are getting into the sheep and goat industry and you're worried and you're nervous and you're scared about lambing. Um, feel confident in yourself because we have undergrad students that are from uh, you know, downtown Minneapolis that in, in, uh, in a couple of weeks training are, are confident enough to go out and work with the ewes. And, and I leave it up to the, to the ewes, uh, up to the students to pull the lambs, to take care of the lambs, and, and it's a student-ran flock. So hopefully tonight you'll feel a little more confidence as you move forward and, and prepare for this, because some of it may seem a little overwhelming. Some of it may seem a little bit scary at times, but uh, trust me, uh, you can do it. You can do it if they can do it. So 
just to begin with a little bit, uh, and we're going to spend most of the time talking tonight about assisting ewes and, and, and the delivery of lambs, but let's just focus, maybe step back and just talk about the, the causes of death, okay? It's our goal at the University of Minnesota with our Hampshire show lamb flock, our goal is to wean about 180 to 200% lamb crop. And so with that goal, we really work hard at making sure we get uh, a large number of lambs born, born alive, and get them off to a good start. But the three concerns that, you know, of death that we could have in new lambs, and this is uh, what's really concerning, would be those lambs that maybe we didn't do a good job and so they're born dead. Uh, those lambs that maybe uh, we didn't give proper assistance to or maybe didn't get uh, get to the U in time. So the three concerns that we're worried about is born dead or stillborns, starvation. And Whitney's going to talk a little bit uh, about uh, colostrum quality and getting those lambs to uh, getting them off on a good start. So colostrum quality, making sure those lambs are suckling, definitely starvation. And the third concern that we're worried about is hypothermia. And, and, and I'm not going to touch on this much tonight. Whitney will, may, uh, will visit with you about that. But making sure that these lambs are born into an environment that uh, uh, allows their bodies to function, don't, uh, keeping them from getting chilled uh, and giving them a good start. So I'm going to talk mainly about uh, uh, getting them born alive and, and some of the things involved with that tonight. So I'm going to spend most of my time using the terms in the context of sheep and lambing, but most of this information that we're visiting with you tonight about uh, can certainly be applied to the goat industry um, and used uh, with your does as well. But uh, this is more in the context of, of sheep, but again, we can use the same information for goats. So uh, I think it's important, and I, I work with the students on this, it's important to kind of understand the uh, the yearly cycle of sheep, if you're gonna be a good shepherd. And the average gestation length in sheep is about 147 days. And that'll vary maybe a little bit by breed. Uh, goats will be slightly longer. And uh, the reason this is important because it allows us as uh, uh, students in the class and people watching the flock, we have breeding dates on all our use. Uh, we use a ram marking harness and that allows us to know when those ewes are gonna lamb. And so we can get those ewes up into the drop pin ahead of time, uh, generally about five to 10 days ahead of time. And then it allows us to do a better job of closely observing our use. Uh, and so we use a, a system where we, we get those use up because we know they're, they're uh, lambing dates, okay? So we have them up in the drop pin. And as I'm working with my students, we, I kind of work with them on what are the signs that indicate a U is gonna give birth? If we can understand the signs and what to look for, It'll hopefully allow us to be more observant and it'll allow us to be there when we need to be there if that you needs assistance. So there's several signs to look for. Good advice to probably start looking for these signs as early as 135 days. So that's uh, uh, a week to two weeks ahead of time. It's, it's, uh, it's not unusual here at the University of Minnesota to have a you uh, drop a lamb 10 days early, um, a healthy lamb, a vigorous lamb. Um, and to drop that lamb 10 days early. And so we try to look uh, uh, and get those ewes up in the drop in and start studying those ewes and watching those ewes quite a bit early. After observing uh, these signs, it's usually, uh, it tells us that there's gonna be delivered within two to 15 hours. So what are the signs we're gonna look for, okay? No different than in other species, if you grew up around the cattle business or other species, a lot of species are very similar in, in how the, the female will uh, act, her behavior uh, as she's getting ready to birth, okay. We have a, a large drop pin, uh, so we bring all our ewes up to there, and, and if then that drop pin is large enough, it allows the ewes to go find a quiet area. So as the students are watching the ewes on lambing watch, if they notice the ewe uh, work herself into the corner, uh, go away from the others, uh, that tends to be one of those ewes we'll start watching. The, the nesting behavior, the smelling or pawing at the ground is a very good sign. Uh, it's interesting that you'll see uh, cattle actually do this and you'll actually see sows in the fairing crates do this, even though they're on a hard metal surface, they still conduct uh, that behavior. So the smelling, the pawing is really important. They'll act nervous, they'll act rest, uh, restless. Uh, they may show some up and down, uncomfortable kind of attitude. Uh, use off feed. We hand feed our ewes into kind of a, a bunk system. And so right away, the shepherd uh, young lady will know right away after she's fed those ewes that night, 
uh, that that ewe is, didn't come up to get her grain, that there's probably uh, a good chance that she's going to lamb that night or even early that uh, next morning. They'll start to spring a little bit behind, to borrow a dairy term. Uh, the vulva will loosen. It'll kind of show more of a relaxed look to it. And so that's also a good sign to look for. All these signs by themselves or in unison will give you a good, uh, good confidence that that ewe is going to lamb. Okay. Um, then as they get closer, you might see some more distinct characteristics. The udder, uh, even though it appears big uh, and filled out, it'll even get larger. Uh, that estrogen surge at the end will really increase the, the, the udder size. The teats will start to swell up a little bit. So you'll, you'll start seeing that. You'll start seeing some increased breathing, more, maybe heavy panting uh, as they get closer. And then the baby will tend to drop. Um, and you'll see the upper, upper uh, rib cage right behind their last rib kind of uh, where the paunch is on some animals, you'll see that kind of cave in and you'll see that baby almost drop and start to turn to get into its proper positioning. Uh, you'll start to see that dropping and turning. And then you'll, we'll talk about it, but uh, you'll start maybe at the end of the first stage, you'll see the mucus plug, then ultimately the water will break and the straining to push the lambs, okay? And after the water breaks, uh, you'll uh, be confident that she's going to deliver here within an hour or so. So we'll break that down a little bit more as we go here. So the three parts of delivery, okay, and, and, and the last two are pretty obvious. Maybe the first one, sometimes you'll have kind of a, a silent you that you might even not notice, okay. But the first stage of delivery uh, for, for ewes or goats or cows or whatever uh, is basically uterine contraction, and that could be very silent. You might not even notice that. And then at the same time, their body's getting into a system where uh, some hormonal release and the cervix will start to dilate. Hopefully you'll get good dilation and we'll touch a little bit on one of the slides about what happens if the cervix is partially dilated or not even dilated at all. Uh, but this could last as little as three hours in older use, uh, up to 12 or even longer in younger use. So it can be a, a kind of an extended time period. You may not see many of the hours. You may not notice anything. They may actually, actually act somewhat normal. And then towards the end, you might start to see some of those abnormal behaviors uh, that we talked about earlier, uh, getting away from the flock, restlessness, pat, uh, panting a little bit. Near the end of this phase, you might start seeing a clear whitish discharge, kind of a mucus looking discharge. Uh, the presence of this mucus uh, kind of means that the lambing procedure is uh, starting to begin. They're getting into phase two, which is basically when we can be confident that they're actually going to lamb. So at the end of this phase, you might start seeing that mucus discharge or the mucus plug. Okay. And so then we get into the actual labor stage. And this, by definition, is a lot of, uh, it's called the second stage. And this is the delivery phase. And this is when you're going to see things happen. You're going to see the uh, water bag or the water bags uh, start to lubricate and they'll rupture and, and they serve a purpose. Uh, the first water bag that get breaks generally serves as the initial lubricant and then as they get expelling that lamb you'll oftentimes see a second water bag and that's the one that really allows for that extra lubrication uh, that allows for the lamb to, to uh, be born more easily. Okay. Sometimes, we'll talk about this later on, sometimes if a ewe's been straining a long time and that water bag has been broken or been out for a long time, you could actually get in a situation where her, her uh, birth canal gets, can get dried out. So, but Mother Nature made them this way. They made the water bag to be a very useful part of the physiology and it allows us to, also, you know, to, uh, to have an easier birth, allows the ewe's to have an easier birth. The ewe will start straining in this phase and they'll want to expel the lamb. And at this stage, is this where you can kind of kind of turn your stopwatch on and, and, and maybe start counting uh, if you're worried about it? Sometimes if they lamb in the middle of the night, you don't see any of this. But if you're there observing your ewes, you might uh, start the watch and kind of keep a track of, of how those ewes are progressing. Um, this stage will last about one to two hours, hopefully, about 15 to 30 minutes per lamb or kid. If it gets to be any longer than that between lambs or between the moment where you saw the water bag, if it gets to be over an hour, you might need to do a little bit of exploratory um, observation or even maybe an exploratory palpation just to see where that you is at. Uh, is the lamb presented in the birth canal? Is she making any progress? I tell my students to kind of sit back and, and watch these ewes as they begin to lamb, but then also write down the time they started pushing and heavy straining and then the time they see the water bag 
um, and then from there go with the time. And if it gets to be more than an hour, I, I usually instruct my students then to, and we'll talk about it, uh, sleeve up and do a little bit of uh, exploratory palpation to see where that use at, okay? Um, different breeds will have different time lengths, but more, more times than not, one hour is kind of a, a, good, a good time to work with. And then they get to the third stage, and this is a stage that's uh, most people, uh, you know, obvious to most people. This is the expulsion of the fetal membranes and involution of the uterus. So this is the uh, basically getting rid of the afterbirth of the placenta. Um, and this could be as short as, um, you know, right away initially can come out very much after the last lamb. Or it could last up to three hours or unfortunately, it may be even longer for some, okay? This will occur naturally. Um, so really at this point, if it's right after the birth of the U, I tell my students uh, to not really do anything, let the afterbirth naturally shuck itself out. Um, we do not pull the afterbirth out. I know I've talked to some people that don't like to see that afterbirth hang in there. We do not do that. Uh, potential to damage uh, the U could be, could be there if you pull too hard and cause some uh, hemorrhaging. And so we try to stay away from that. And then if the afterbirth is still there after a day or two, we, we tend to just let that mother nature take its course. I know there's some people that don't like that unsightly look, um, but uh, you know, in our facility, we, we can keep the bedding kind of clean. There's not much risk of infection. And so we just kind of let mother nature take its course. I know uh, there's some tricks that you know, people have told me. Some people like to cut the afterbirth halfway up. Uh, I've talked to some other vets that like to just leave it hanging there. They'd say the extra way to allow natural pull, um, but we don't do much uh, as far as that. Now there is some debate over letting the U eat their placenta and I, I, that's kind of an interesting discussion. Uh, what do we do at the University of Minnesota? Uh, we do not let the U eat their placenta. We clean up all afterbirth and we put it in the biohazard bin to go, uh, to go out of the barn, okay? There is some debate. I've read some good articles, talked to some producers that think it's part of mother nature, that that U is, it's our natural defense mechanism. They talk about some oxytocin release and oxytocin in the placenta. And then there's some other uh, experts in the field that really are concerned about disease spread through placental droppings, such as scrapies, one of them. And so that's an interesting discussion, but we do not at the University of Minnesota, I actually don't like to have uh, that disease possibility uh, laying there in the straw. So we tend to destroy and get rid of all our afterbirth uh, after the use are done cleaning. So here's some photos that uh, I like to show the students in class just to give them a visual representation. Uh, again, the students that I get in the class and are teaching them how to lamb out use, I've never, uh, never seen it, never been around it. And so Sometimes the visual way of learning is really good for many of those students. So here's the, basically a lamb being born, expulsion of the lamb. Um, a lamb, you know, already up and looking pretty vigorous. Stands within 30 minutes would just be ideal. And that's kind of what we're shooting for in our barn. You can see the mother is cleaning that little lamb off and, and ensuring a healthy start. And then the expulsion of the afterbirth, okay? Again, uh, we do not, uh, do any help, we let the U naturally expel our afterbirth and we then we just pick it up out of the pen and, and, and dispose of it, 